I will talk again about pulmonary hypertension. I uh, modified the presentation, added more few cases, uh, um, and did some changes. Uh, so we'll talk about definition of pulmonary hypertension, definition of pulmonary arterial hyper hypertension. Uh, we'll talk about pathophysiology, pathology, uh, diagnosis, uh, uh, complex cases, uh, treatment, and finally uh, prognosis. So first, definition of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is defined by your increase in the main pulmonary artery pressure to a number uh, equal to or more than 25 millimeter mercury, diagnosed by right heart cath, uh, diagnosed uh, during uh, rest. Uh, this number, 25, is not really the upper limit of normal. Uh, our normal mean pulmonary artery pressure is about uh, 14, uh, plus or minus 3. So there is a gray zone between 20 and 25, and this uh, area is receiving uh, more attention in the last few years because of more studies trying to investigate the effect and the outcome of people with uh, uh, intermediate or borderline uh, pulmonary artery uh, pressure. Uh, one of them was the VA study that included so many patients. They had uh, data uh, for patients who underwent right heart cath, normal borderline, and people with pulmonary hypertension. Patients with uh, borderline pulmonary artery pressure, they had worse outcome. And you can see the line here. Uh, there is increased uh, mortality once you uh, pass uh, that uh, 19 point. So actually, it didn't start at 25, which we use for diagnosis. So it, start, it starts more, much earlier upper limit of normal is actually 20, and after that you have increased mortality. That was replicated in multiple studies, including a study from Vanderbilt. They cast also about 4,000 patients. You can see the same trend. This is adjusted mortality. This is unadjusted mortality. You can see people with borderline pulmonary hypertension, they have worse outcome. And I think the updated guidelines will be published by the end of this year. They might actually change the definition of pulmonary uh, hypertension and lower that cut point from 25 to 20. It's not yet published, but it, it is anticipated that you may find a change in the definition of pulmonary hypertension reflecting uh, these studies and other uh, studies published in the last uh, couple of years after the publication of the 2015 uh, guidelines. Uh, types of uh, pulmonary hypertension, we have five types. Type 1, which we call it pulmonary arterial hypertension. Type 2, which we uh, call it secondary to left-sided problem, either systolic, diastolic heart failure, valve problem. It, it's always difficult to distinguish uh, the diastolic uh, heart failure, HFPF, from actual true uh, pH. Group 3, which is uh, due to interstitial lung disease, COPD, obesity, hypoventilation, sleep apnea, or high altitude. Uh, pulmonary hypertension. We had a case of high altitude pulmonary hypertension recently. That's group uh, three. Uh, CTIF uh, is group four, mainly due to chronic thromboemboli, but we have other rare causes such as pulmonary artery angiosarcoma, rare parasitic diseases occupying pulmonary artery and vasculitis. Uh, and group five, which include other causes such as sickle cell anemia. Remember that for your board because that was changed from group one to group uh, uh, five. It, it has different characteristics. Even the ATS uh, statement uh, of diagnosis, they use lower PVR for diagnosis. We usually define PAH as uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, three or more. In sickle cell anemia, they lower that number to uh, two woods uh, units, so that can be different. You have sarcoidosis, LAM, histocytosis X, uh, renal failure with patients on dialysis. We had a case before, high cardiac output because of fistula resulting in pulmonary hypertension. So all of these the other etiologies, they have different pathologies and, and, and pathogenesis, and they grouped all of these uh, etiologies in group uh, five. So pH, you only look at the mean pulmonary artery pressure, but pH, you look at other criteria, including the wedge pressure. It has to be low pulmonary vascular resistance. It has to be high and uh, ruling out other causes of pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, such as C. diff and uh, significant lung disease or other rare uh, diseases. Then when we talk about group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension, you have different causes, idiopathic, heritable, uh, associated with drug and toxins, or induced with drug and toxin, and associated with other things, such as connective tissue disease, HIV, uh, liver disease, portopulmonary, and congenital heart disease. With congenital heart disease, you can further subclassify that into Eisenmenger syndrome uh, and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension with coincidental uh, cardiac defect and pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with shunt uh, from um, left to uh, right. Uh, 
and pulmonary arterial hypertension that happen after defect closure. So you usually start with shunt from left to right. If, if the shunt is, is large uh, and you have significant QP, QS, and significant shunt, you can have increase in your pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary hypertension, and then you can have shunt reversal that result in Eisenmenger uh, physiology or Eisenmenger syndrome, and we will talk about that uh, in the management. And if you have a cardiac defect, it doesn't mean it is causing pulmonary hypertension. A lot of time you have a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension and very small SD or PFO. That small PFO or small SD is likely not the cause of that severe pulmonary hypertension associated. Uh, in fact, it might act as a safety valve to decompress the right ventricle. So in, in old days, you used to do atrial septostomy to relieve pressure. Sometimes the PFO may open and you might have a, a right to left shunt with Eisenmenger physiology in, in, in these uh, cases. Uh, if we touch base about epidemiology, the median age uh, about uh, 50. These are two uh, registries, the French one and the Revere registry. Revere registry is the main U.S. Uh, registry. Uh, it highlights the incidence, uh, prevalence, uh, female to male ratio. So it is a rare disease. Uh, it happens more in uh, female. And you have breakdown mm -hmm. on different uh, causes here, including uh, drug and toxin, which you always have to take a good history to reveal history of drug and toxin. Uh, the French registry had more HIV uh, uh, cases uh, when you compare it to uh, the US-based registry. Medications used to... So looking at other characteristics, I, I put this table, it's a busy table, but I, I wanted to highlight a point that your mean age at diagnosis is, is different and progressively increasing. So if you look at the NIH registry in, in the 80s, the mean age was around, around 35 or 36. Uh, with more advanced therapy and, and uh, we are doing more echoes and we are diagnosing pulmonary hypertension in more elderly people. You can see the Compera registry, which is a, a European-based registry. Uh, the mean age of diagnosis is 71. And you can see the mean age of diagnosis between these two uh, registries to be in the mid-50s, such as the Revere registry and the French one. The Chinese one had a, a lower uh, a median uh, or mean age, but that's likely because of uh, most of these uh, cases with con congenital heart disease. They have 43% congenital heart disease related cases with pulmonary hypertension. And this number is completely different if you try to look at the breakdown in other registries, 11%, 10%. Uh, so probably that's why this number is lower. And, and and that reflect our practice. We tend to diagnose pulmonary hypertension in more elderly uh, people every uh, day. Uh, you have to take a good history because if you don't take a good history, you will never know uh, this is drug and toxin related uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, there is more attention now uh, about uh, amphetamines, and I think this might uh, removed, uh, might be removed from the likely to definite uh, in the updated guidelines as well because uh, more research has been done in, in amphetamine induced or amphetamine uh, 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 associated pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension. Most of these studies came from Stanford, molecular studies and, and clinical uh, uh, registry as well. Uh, people who abuse uh, methamphetamine and they have pulmonary hypertension, they have reduce CIS1 expression. This is a normal uh, uh, lung. This is a staining of the endothelium, and this is staining of that C, uh, CIS1. And you can see here, uh, patient one, two, three, and four, uh, they have decreased expression of CIS1, and basically what it does, it helps uh, metabolizing uh, amphetamine. So people with CIS1 deficiency, they have a higher tendency to develop a pulmonary arterial hypertension and uh, they have more vascular uh, uh, apoptosis. And there is underlying genetic basis for the deficiency of uh, CIS-1 in those uh, individuals. Uh, not only uh, the studies targeting the pathogenesis, but only looked at uh, the outcome of people with methamphetamine-induced or amphetamine-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension. And they found that these patients, they have more severe hemodynamics upon presentation, and they have worse outcome. You can see here your 10-year, this is a 15-year study from Stanford, and you can see the 10-year outcome here, the, it's 25% uh, the event-free survival in, in patients with methamphetamine-induced pulmonary hypertension and idiopathic or pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is idiopathic in the other group, is about 50%. So the outcome can be completely different uh, based on uh, your uh, etiology. Pathogenesis, mainly three pathways. This is from 2004, 2014. It's almost the same figure, three pathways. We don't have medications approved 
uh, till this point targeting any other pathway other than the nitric oxide endothelium prostacyclin pathway. You try to block the endothelium uh, pathway because it can cause vasoconstriction, and you try to stimulate the nitric oxide and the prost prostacyclin or uh, the prostanoid uh, uh, pathway. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one thing about sildenafil, tadalafil, and Leuciguat. Leuciguat uh, was approved recently, a few years ago. And uh, there, are, there are some studies looking at, at switching between a PDE5 inhibitor and using a Leuciguat and the rationale behind it. You have nitric oxide deficiency in people with uh, pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension. So if, if you have already nitric oxide deficiency, you might not have that big of response if you inhibit the enzyme that metabolizes the nitric oxide because you already have deficiency of nitric oxide. So it makes sense to target uh, uh, the uh, uh, soluble guanylate cyclase uh, directly. Uh, so if you have even deficiency of nitric oxide, you bypass this point. That's the idea about the respite study and the replace study uh, that is ongoing now. We never ask about prenatal history or history of preeclampsia or eclampsia, but probably uh, you can have a, a hit uh, uh, in, in young age, uh, even prenatal, and that can translate into endothelial injury and uh, more susceptibility to develop uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension uh, uh, later. That's, that's a concept as well. Uh, also, this, this figure is important here. It, it highlights the hemodynamics of pulmonary hypertension uh, during uh, the course uh, of the disease. Uh, you can notice that your right atrial pressure tends to go up uh, in advanced diseases. Cardiac output uh, start to come down. PVR uh, continues to go up during the disease progression. But I wanted you to focus on the pulmonary artery pressure. The pulmonary artery pressure increase at the beginning of the disease. Once you reach a point, you're starting to have heart failure. The mean pulmonary artery pressure actually goes down. So you shouldn't rely only on your mean pulmonary artery pressure as a diagnostic or prognostic factor. Actually, the mean pulmonary artery pressure will be the least prognostic indicator in, in all of those uh, numbers. I'll give you an example. If you have a patient at this point of the curve and another patient at this point of the curve, you will have the mean uh, pulmonary artery pressure, which will be the same. If you look at hypothetical number, mean pulmonary artery pressure is 40 in both cases, but this case, it, it is on the descending slope uh, of the curve, so you already have heart failure with low cardiac output. You have uh, increased mean right atrial pressure uh, due to the right-sided heart failure, and you have very high PVR. Different patient, mean pulmonary artery pressure is 40, but cardiac output is preserved, lower PVR, lower uh, mean right atrial pressure. Cardiac output and cardiac index and the right mean right atrial pressure are very important prognostic factors because they reflect the right-sided heart function, uh, which is the main determinant in prognosis in pulmonary hypertension. So you will treat these two patients differently based on your uh, uh, functional class as well. These uh, patients at that descending part of the curve tend to be sicker. They have more advanced uh, functional uh, class, so you shouldn't uh, 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 say, or oh, both of them, they have mean pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, so despite having the mean pulmonary artery pressure, you can be at different stages uh, of your disease. This is the pressure volume curve uh, for the right ventricle. It is different from the pressure volume curve, curve of the left ventricle. The right ventricle curve is more triangular or trapezoidal in shape. The reason is you don't have the isovolumic contraction and relaxation phase, which usually you see on the left ventricle. This is usually the shape of the left uh, ventricle pressure volume loop. So it is completely different. But when you subject the right ventricle to increase afterload, the right ventricle start to compensate and the pressure volume loop of the right ventricle start to look like more of compensated, uh, uh, looks like left ventricle. And that stage is the compensation. Okay. So at that stage you have thick septum, you have concentric hypertrophy and the patient is compensated. Uh, this line here is the uh, systolic elastance, and uh, when you try to compensate, your systolic function increases, you try to overcome the increase after load, and after a certain point, your right ventricle fail, and you have decompensated right ventricle, and you have eccentric hypertrophy, and that uh, pressure volume loop moves to the right with decreased systolic elastance and decreased cardiac output, and that's how your right ventricle will look like. Look, that, look at the difference between these two right ventricles. This is concentric hypertrophy, compensated right ventricle, and this ventricle is thin, dilated, and uh, this is a failing uh, decompensated uh, right uh, ventricle. Uh, 
Right ventricular adaptation can be different uh, in different causes of the disease. So it, if you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, you don't have the same uh, outcome. Uh, specific causes of the pulmonary hy arterial hypertension, they have different outcomes. Look at this uh, uh, survival curve. Uh, Eisenmenger patients tend to do better. They still have fetal programming of the right ventricle, so they have less ten tendency of the right ventricle to fail. Uh, compare that to uh, sclerosis, uh, scleroderma patients, systemic sclerosis. They have uh, uh, more advanced disease, they have worse uh, outcome. And all of that goes back to the right ventricle. Look at the Eisenmenger patients' characteristic of the right ventricle. They have more hypertrophy, they have more contractility, they have less RV fibrosis, and they have less diastolic uh, stiffness. Try to compare that to scleroderma patients. They have less hypertrophy, they have less RV contractility, they have more fibrosis, and they have more uh, diastolic uh, uh, stiffness. Uh, so you can have favorable uh, uh, factor in the right ventricle and negative factor that can impact your uh, outcome, and that can be different according to your underlying etiology of your pulmonary arterial hypertension. Remodeling happened in the pulmonary circulation and in the right ventricle. There are similarities and there are differences. Uh, the differences you see is uh, pulmonary circulation, you have uh, resistance to apoptosis, so you have proliferation of cells, and you can see the plexiform lesion, which is narrow, trying to obliterate the vascular bed. Uh, but on the right ventricle, you have uh, apoptosis and growth arrest, and eventually you have thin uh, right ventricle. Uh, microcirculation, you have angiogenesis in the pulmonary circulation, and you have decreased capillary density in the right ventricle. So these two points are different between the pulmonary circulation and the right ventricle. At the main time, you have similarities, such as the fibrosis, mitochondrial remodeling and dysfunction, and shift in your uh, uh, metabolic pathway to the glycolytic uh, uh, pathway, which we will uh, discuss uh, here in a second. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is like cancer. Uh, the uh, endothelial cells and muscle cells uh, uh, have uh, characteristics uh, similar to cancer. And our approach of treatment now is similar to cancer. You use multiple uh, drugs, combination therapy in the upfront. You try to target multiple pathways uh, during your uh, uh, treatment. Uh, not only the proliferation and resistant to apoptosis, but also uh, the metabolism. When you do a PET scan for cancer patient, uh, they have what's called Warburg effect, and that's because you have increased glucose uptake, you have more glycolysis, so that's why that's the idea behind the PET scan. When you do it, the cancer cells tend to take more glucose, and you highlight or you take this glucose and you have the PET scan uh, positive, and that happens also in pulmonary hypertension. This is a mild pH. You look at the free wall of the right uh, ventricle, and in severe pulmonary hypertension, you shift to the carbohydrate metabolism and glycolytic pathway, and that's why in PET scan that lights up. This is the same patient before treatment, and after three months of treatment with EPO, you can see the reversibility of the metabolism of the right ventricle with less glucose uptake. So the right ventricle usually will utilize your fatty acid as the main source of energy. When you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, there is a shift in uh, 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 the metabolism, and the right ventricle ut utilize more of carbohydrate and less utilization of fatty acid, and that result in fatty acid accumulation in the right ventricle, and that can cause lipotoxicity of the right ventricle, and that can contribute to the right ventricular failure. Look at this imaging. This is water peak and lipid peak. This is pH, and this is control. Uh, clearly, there is high lipid uh, peak in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension with involvement of the right ventricle, and actually, actually this is a pathway of treatment uh, that's being developed and we have one, one study uh, uh, that we will start soon uh, trying to uh, uh, focus on the mitochondrial uh, uh, metabolism uh, looking at the BDK inhibitor uh, 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 targeting uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase which goes back to the glycolytic pathways of pulmonary hypertension. So this pathway of metabolism, we don't have approved medicine. Uh, for that pathway, but that should be the pathway of treatment because the main determinant of prognosis is the right ventricular function. And we have no medicine that actually targets the right ventricle. All the medications try to cause pulmonary artery vasodilation. Uh, dilation. Heath Edwards grade, grading, you have a progressive increase in, in the thickness of uh, the media and intima reaction, and eventually you start from reversible 
lesion to irreversible lesion. It used to be grade 1 to 6 and the updated classification they had grade 1 to 4, grade 3, 4 and 6 used to be irreversible and now grade 4 is the irreversible uh, stage which is very advanced and, and you try to treat the patient earlier when you have that reversible changes because if you have very advanced uh, stage of pulmonary hypertension you have a complex uh, uh, intimal vascular lesion you might have uh, you might not have the good response because already the vascular lumen is obliterated and, and that's why a lot of time you start the treatment very late and you don't see the expected response with re reverse remodeling of the right ventricle and reduction of your main pulmonary uh, artery uh, pressure. The only problem, this is not a homogeneous uh, 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 process so you don't know uh, which stage uh, you cannot do a biopsy, for example, and say this is stage 4 or stage 3, because that can be different in different parts uh, of the lung. Uh, diagnosis is, is, uh, is always delayed, and uh, uh, that's called the delay study from Australia, and they, they track those patients since the first symptoms, presentation to the primary care, presentation to pulmonologist, cardiologist, till they presented to PH center, and they had the diagnosis, and you can see uh, the time. Uh, and this time is, is consistent, uh, actually, between different registries, even Revere registry, more than 20% of patients, they had delay of diagnosis more than uh, two years. And in that study here from Australia, the patient presented to medical, uh, sought medical att attention after 12 months of symptom onset. They had average of five visits to uh, primary care, three visits to uh, pulmonologist or cardiologist before the referral. So there is a delay in the diagnosis and that can impact your uh, outcome because if, if you look at the studies that were done and uh, they uh, included the patients in open uh, label extension of those studies, people who did not have that treatment for 12 months, even when they are receiving that treatment in the open label, they did worse. The improvement in six minute walk test was not equal to those patients who received the actual treatment. So when you do randomized control study and you give the active medicine to one group and placebo to the other group, if you do open label extension, you can give the medicine, the actual effective medicine to everyone. People who received the placebo for 12 weeks, they didn't reach that increase in the six minute walk distance when they are compared to the other people who were receiving the treatment, active treatment during the active phase of the study. And that goes back again uh, to delay treatment. You might have more progression of the disease and less response. So the earlier, the better is the treatment. Symptoms can be uh, deceiving. And uh, dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, palpitation, uh, syncope is always an ominous sign. And we ask about syncope and dizziness in every clinic uh, visit, uh, even in the follow-up. We use different modalities for diagnosis, uh, EKG, chest X-ray, echo, uh, sometimes MRI, uh, VQ scan uh, on everyone, and right heart catheterization uh, on everyone as well, pulmonary angiography if you uh, are diagnosing a case of uh, CTF. Uh, when you have a patient, you try to find out, uh, usually the patient presents with an echo, and you try to find out if the patient has other comorbid condition that can explain that uh, echo finding. So you try to exclude other cardiac diseases and other significant lung diseases, right? So you do your pulmonary function mm -hmm. test, you make sure the patient doesn't have systolic heart failure, uh, uh, diastolic heart failure, you look at your uh, valves, um, and uh, you can have no significant pulmonary and, and uh, uh, cardiac uh, problem and pulmonary hypertension. In that case, you will continue your work up for pulmonary hypertension. You do your VQ scan. If you think CTF, you do pulmonary angiography. If you do VQ scan and you don't have a, a, a finding consistent with CTF, you will proceed with the workup of PAH, trying to make sure it's not HIV related, connective tissue, and so on. Some tricky cases with, when you have some comorbid cardiac and, and pulmonary condition, but pulmonary hypertension, and, and they recommend the referral for expert center because you might have a comorbid condition, comorbid COPD and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And that's completely different from someone who has advanced COPD resulting in group uh, three uh, pulmonary hypertension due to severity of the disease. Classic AKG, that's one of our patients. You can see the uh, incomplete right bundle, bundle branch block, RV strain, uh, depression of the T wave. Uh, you can see uh, right uh, axis uh, uh, on that uh, EKG, uh, prominent uh, P wave uh, or P pulmonale. Uh, all of these are signs of right 
uh, ventricular strain, and you can see it in pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, on X-ray, this is one of our patients. You can see the pulmonary artery here is, is huge. You can see it on bilateral X-ray. Decreased retrosternal airspace, which is consistent with right ventricular uh, enlargement. Uh, this is also enlargement of the left pulmonary uh, artery. Uh, on the CT, even if you are getting the CT for other reason, you have to pick up abnormalities that can be suggestive of underlying pulmonary uh, hypertension, because usually the patient have shortness of breath. You might order CT to rule out PE, but you could have finding suggestive of underlying pulmonary hypertension, enlargement of the pulmonary artery, reflux of contrast into the inferior vena cava, into the hepatic vein, uh, severe enlargement of the right atrium, severe enlargement of the inferior vena cava uh, can be seen. Uh, all of these uh, are uh, our uh, patients. Uh, you might have uh, uh, in situ thrombosis in very advanced uh, severe cases. This is uh, not usual, but it can be tricky uh, to differentiate that from uh, uh, CTF as well. But here you can see how big is the descending branch of the left pulmonary uh, artery. Echo. Usually you have a patient presenting with an echo. On the echo you have to make sure you don't have HFPF or systolic heart failure, significant valve disease, but also you can calculate your systolic pulmonary artery pressure. To do that you should have a good tricuspid valve uh, velocity and this is uh, the formula uh, here. And that can be tricky because sometimes you might underestimate or overestimate if you don't have a good tricuspid envelope. If, if you don't have good tricuspid envelope, if you say the peak is here, your pressure is 21. If you say, no, the peak is here, you can actually overestimate it to 60. And that's what happens when you get an echo and the patient doesn't have those symptoms consistent with severity and the echo is reading as RVSP of 80. It's, it's depending on that, how you measure uh, your tricuspid valve uh, uh, envelope. And this actual patient actually had a pressure of 36. So this is an underestimation, this is an overestimation. So that's the source of discrepancy uh, between the calf and echo. Also, when you have right-sided heart failure and dilated and hypokinetic RV, your pressure is probably underestimated uh, because you are on the descending slope uh, with the right-sided heart uh, failure. I'm not sure if uh, the echo will play. Uh, this is a patient with uh, pulmonary hypertension, one of our patients. You can see septal bounce, enlargement of the right atrium. Uh, the right ventricle is clearly larger than the left ventricle. Sometimes it can even affect your cardiac output uh, uh, of the left uh, ventricle. And um, uh, this was advanced case of pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension. These are summary of the findings you might see. We saw that on the echo already, enlargement of the right side, enlargement of the pulmonary artery and inferior vena cava. These findings here can help you to differentiate uh, HFPF uh, from uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. You look at the EA ratio, but also at E, uh, e prime uh, ratio. Uh, this is from the mitral inflow uh, track, and this is the tissue doppler of the mitral uh, uh, valve. Uh, you can take the ratio between the E and E prime. If it's less than 10, uh, that's indicative of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, if it's more than 10, uh, that can be due to uh, diastolic uh, dysfunction. You look at the uh, right ventricular outflow track acceleration wave. If your acceleration wave is less than 105, uh, that will indicate likely uh, you have PH. In diastolic heart failure, it will be lower. The acceleration time is, is lower because you reach the peak quickly because the pressure is very high in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And you can have a notch here uh, that's also related to the very high resistance you have in your pulmonary artery. Usually, you don't see this uh, with uh, uh, HFPF. And these are some formulas that you might use to predict uh, your pressures. But again, the gold standard is uh, doing a right heart cath. But if you give me the RVSP, you can expect your mean pulmonary artery pressure will be 0.6, your pulmonary artery systolic pressure. If you have the EA clearly uh, written on the echo, uh, you can uh, actually estimate. And that number here, put, put number 10 here. 10 multiplied by 1.24, add 1.9, that's actually about 14 point something. So which pressure of 15, right, if that number is, is actually uh, more than 10, it will give you a widget pressure of 15, which you see uh, usually with HIF. Uh, VQ scan is, is very important test and it's underutilized and uh, uh, it can, the only curable type of pulmonary hypertension is CTF. You take the clots out, the patient is off medicine, off oxygen, asymptomatic, uh, and we underutilize it. This is a, a query study that included academic and community center. You can see only 62% of the patient underwent VQ scan 
in academic centers versus 48%. Uh, we order VQ scan on every single patient uh, coming to the clinic. Uh, you can be surprised at how many patients you might diagnose. Uh, even if, if you have a cause that can be explaining the pulmonary hypertension still, we do VQ scan. Uh, you can play the video. Uh, this is a VQ scan in the patient with a CTF. This is pulmonary angiography. There is uh, impaired perfusion here, mainly in the right uh, middle lobe. There is impaired perfusion here in uh, uh, the left lower lobe. So you get abnormal uh, VQ scan. You can see here, for example, in the right lateral, this area is corresponding to that perfusion uh, defect here in the right middle lobe. And as well on the right side, you do your pulmonary angiography, and then you send them for evaluation of uh, uh, pulmonary from the endarterectomy. This is the specimen from one of our patients. She is on. Uh, she was used to be on remodeling, and she's off treatment on room air. She's not receiving any uh, treatment. Right heart cath. Uh, right heart cath. It, I, I always ask for the actual, uh, not the report, but the actual tracing as well. And I like to do the cath myself because you can diagnose a lot of things during the right heart cath based on your catheter course, your waveform. Uh, uh, and uh, the report is, is not sufficient uh, to help you in uh, the diagnosis. This was a patient, usually you do the cath with me, this is the course of the catheter if you go through the inferior vena cava. We had a patient, he was, she was 66 and she came for evaluation of shortness of breath and abnormal echo, and this is the course of the catheter. The catheter crossed to the other side, we thought it's arterial. So that patient had a left-sided inferior vena cava, continuation of the inferior vena cava as hemiozygous vein joining superior vena cava on the left side and she didn't have any dextrocardia and she had some element of polysplenia which happened with that syndrome uh, but this is the course of the catheter here so of course that's abnormal we, we, we know where we were based on just the waveform right when you have the right ventricular waveform you know you are in the right ventricle when you have the wedge form you know you are widget or you are in the pulmonary artery uh, so we went up to the hemiozygous vein and then through uh, superior vena cava down to the right atrium, right ventricle and pulmonary artery. Uh, so if, if you have the report, the report will say normal pressures. The patient had normal pressure, she didn't have any shunt, but she has a congenital anomaly. Uh, also waveform uh, is helpful in diagnosis. This is a patient we saw two, three weeks ago in, in Jewish. Uh, she had issue of mitral valve that was replaced in 2000. She had a pacemaker that was placed in 2010. Uh, she had the uh, echo that showed increased right-sided uh, volumes. Uh, you can look at here, she has pulsation in her neck, she has pulsating liver. And uh, when we did the heart cath, this is the waveform in the superior vena cava. This is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. So basically, the waveform in right atrium and superior vena cava is, looks like the waveform in the right ventricle. So she has ventricularization of the waveform, and that indicates open tricuspid regale. She didn't have pulmonary hypertension. What she had is problem with the tricuspid valve, causing increased volume overload to the right ventricle, right ventricular dilation, and uh, it was due to the pacemaker wire. Uh, affecting the closure of the tricuspid uh, valve. So if, if you look at the report, you will say you have normal uh, uh, um, normal pressures, right? Her pulmonary artery pressure was normal, she didn't have any shunt, uh, but without the waveform, you cannot diagnose uh, 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 this case. Pulmonary artery widget pressure, also this is a report I received for patient that we were evaluating in the clinic, and the report mentioned pH, pulmonary widget pressure, 9. Uh, but if you look at the tracing, the index vibration and pulmonary artery which, uh, pressure is actually much higher. It's around 20, uh, not 9. Uh, so that patient was a uh, hef uh, case. And measuring the pulmonary widget pressure and index vibration uh, can give you more, ac uh, more ac approximate numbers to LVDB. Make sure you don't overestimate it as well, because if the patient, if you ask a patient to hold the breath and strain, you might find the widget pressure shooting up, and that might be overestimating uh, as well. So you have to make sure uh, take it in a, a neutral uh, a position. Another uh, case about waveform, this is a patient who was referred from cardiology. She had a cath with pulmonary hypertension, which the pressure was high, but LVDP was normal, and they wanted us to evaluate the patient. Uh, when you look at the waveform in which position, the patient had huge V wave, but that's not mentioned in the report as well, right? So if you don't look at the actual waveform, you might miss the diagnosis. When you see that big V wave, you think about mitral regurgitation, 
you think about uh, pulmonary vein uh, stenosis or left atrial uh, stiff uh, syndrome. Uh, this patient had multiple ablations, so uh, and she didn't have any mitral valve problem. We did a CT with venous phase to evaluate for any pulmonary vein stenosis. She didn't have it, and she was diagnosed with uh, left uh, atrial uh, uh, stiff left atrium uh, syndrome. In these patients, if you vasodilate them, you'll have increased flow to the right, to the left atrium, and they can develop pulmonary edema. And actually, that happened with you know we wanted to try. Uh, trial of sildenafil patient did worse because you develop pulmonary edema if you increase your flow to the stiff left uh, atrium. So she's just managed with diuretics and her symptoms are uh, controlled. This is another patient highlighting the same thing. <coughs> QPQS. We'll, we'll not go through the how to calculate it, but we, we calculated during the, the, the right heart cath. Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight different situations or different scenario of cases because we get consulted a lot about patients with ASD, should we close it, should we keep it open? And uh, this is the guidelines from uh, the European uh, guidelines published in 2015. If you have PVR less than 0.23, you can correct the shunt, you can close it. If your PVR is more than 4.6, uh, uh, the advice against that, or if you have Eisenmenger syndrome, if you have your PVR between 2.3 and 4.6, it's an uh, individual basis. You have to evaluate the patient uh, individually and make uh, the decision. And I don't want you to confuse these two numbers. This is PVR indexed, so that's indexed PVR. PVRI is different from PVR because you might see the number and you think, oh, uh, it's contraindicated above 8. No, the actual PVR is 4.6. The index of BVR is almost double uh, your PVR, like the cardiac output. Almost your cardiac output is double your cardiac uh, index. So you can have three scenarios, scenario one, scenario two, scenario uh, three. We'll, we'll, we'll show a few cases highlighting each uh, of those uh, scenarios. So scenario one. Scenario one, you will have normal PVR and you will have a shunt and the patient doesn't have pulmonary hypertension but have symptoms and extensive uh, shunt, your QPQS should be one. Your pulmonary flow should be equal to the systemic flow. If you are w more than 1.5, that's usually significant. If you have less than one, it indicates Eisenmenger physiology, reversal of shunt, right? So if you have a patient with increased QPQS more than 1.5, any uh, signs uh, of right ventricular uh, failure, a normal PVR, you can refer the patient for uh, surgery. And that's what happened with this patient who had partial anomalous pulmonary venous return on the left side joining vertical vein. She had a shunt correction and she's asymptomatic. She is not on any treatment. So that highlight group one, uh, which you can close the shunt or refer them for surgery. Uh, another patient, you can play this video. Uh, another patient who had uh, 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 partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. His, his shunt fraction wasn't big, it was only 1.4, but she had RV dilation, she was uh, old, she had multiple comorbidities. She, she didn't want to have surgery, which is reasonable at, at that age and with a comorbid condition, she's already 66, so uh, she has been followed. She had a prior heart cath that was reported as normal. So if you don't pay attention also to your saturations, uh, you might miss the diagnosis. If you don't run your saturation, uh, she didn't have pulmonary hypertension, so you might report it as normal uh, care. Third scenario, but this is ACD, the patient almost had a single atrium. Uh, you don't see any septum here. here. Big RV, reflux of contrast into uh, the hepatic vein, huge cardiomegaly on the scalp, film, huge pulmonary arteries. We did the cath, she didn't have uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, but uh, she had a very big shunt up to almost five. And you can see here the echo. It's almost single atrium here. This is a single atrium. This is the right ventricle. And this is after surgery. The septum is closed. Uh, this is with contrast. You don't see uh, uh, the bubbles uh, crossing. So when you do take the right decision in the right situation with low PVR, uh, you have favorable uh, outcomes. Scenario two, you might have a borderline case between these two numbers, less than 4.6 but above uh, 2.4. And, and this was uh, an example of those cases. The patient had pulmonary hypertension. Uh, she had right and left sided superior vena cava. She had partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. She had PFO and SD. Uh, but her PVR was 4.1. The decision was made to go ahead with the surgery. And she did well with the surgery. And actually, the RV pressure went down to 23 over 4 by the end of the surgery. Uh, she remained asymptomatic at uh, three uh, years. So we discussed few cases 
with normal PVR with high QPQS. We discussed the case with borderline uh, resistance uh, that you can consider surgery still. And finally, to finish the scenarios, the third scenario, you will have someone with very elevated uh, PVR. And this patient had basically Eisenmenger physiology because of partial anomalous pulmonary venous return that was not corrected long time ago. She had uh, four anomalous veins. That's why her shunt was so significant. Eventually, de developed Eisenmenger syndrome. Her QPQS is less than one, which you see in Eisenmenger. And she is on uh, parenteral therapy. And the only treatment for her will be uh, lung uh, transplant. And this is another case. She had high PVR, but the patient had the ASD closed in an outside hospital, and that resulted in acute right ventricular failure, dilation of the right ventricle, increased right-sided pressure, and more hypoxia. And that case highlight uh, what detrimental effect you could uh, do if you tr uh, uh, try to close that shunt in case of Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, that shunt was opened again. That's uh, the implantable device was taken out, and the patient is being treated with pH uh, therapy as Eisenmenger uh, patient. Vasoreactivity test, very rarely we'll have patient on calcium channel blocker. Uh, only five to 10% are vasoreactive. We use inhaled nitric oxide. Uh, you have to have decrease in the pressure to a number less than 40 by more than 10 points with preserved cardiac output. Only we consider it in these uh, 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 three subgroups uh, of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, even if the patient is vasoreactive and they have very low cardiac output uh, or uh, bradycardic or low blood pressure, you cannot use calcium channel blocker in these cases because it might precipitate right-sided heart uh, failure. You have to monitor for side effects. This was the only patient we had on calcium channel blocker. She was on amlodipine 30 daily. She developed gingival hyperplasia. Uh, with uh, amlodipine, so we had to stop it and switch it to another medicine. It's, it's not common to, this is actually the patient you are presenting, yeah. Uh, so she had uh, uh, gingival hyperplasia. Uh, we stopped the amlodipine and we will follow up, hopefully it's uh, reversible. General treatment, you give oxygen, avoid hypoxia, you might choose anticoagulation in, in specific subgroups. It's uh, 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 not for everyone. In, in fact, it, uh, it can be associated with worse outcome for in subgroups such as scleroderma uh, patient. You try to avoid general anesthesia. Try to use local anesthesia or epidural anesthesia if uh, uh, needed. Uh, this is a, a case I, I always put there because you have the mean pulmonary artery uh, pressure and the mean arterial pressure, and you can see with induction of anesthesia, trying to intubate someone, if you do, drop your systemic blood pressure so much, you can have cardiac uh, arrest. So this patient had cardiac arrest after intubation and severe dilation of the right ventricle seen by TAE after the intubation. What happened? You induce the patient, you drop your mean arterial blood pressure, and your mean pulmonary artery pressure can exceed your mean uh, uh, arterial blood pressure, and that can result in an arrest uh, uh, situation. Uh, treatment. Uh, you classify patients by functional uh, class and risk, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, and then you decide about your treatment. Uh, there is more uh, uh, use of combination therapy uh, up front, and if the patient has advanced functional class already, you can start combination therapy, including parenteral uh, therapy uh, from uh, the get-go. Uh, initiation of therapy, that's a, a graph representing the practice uh, now, so most of our patients are on uh, combination therapy. Very rarely you will see a patient on uh, a monotherapy. If the patient was very low risk with good functional uh, class, you might still use it, but most of our patients are on combination uh, therapy. These are the treatments available, about 13 medications if you don't count the calcium uh, channel uh, blocker. And they target the three uh, pathways, the nitric oxide pathway, the endothelian pathway, or prost prostacycline pathway. Flolan, Valetri, they have short life of action. Valetri is more stable at room temperature. Triprostanil can be given IV, sub-Q, inhaled, or uh, uh, oral. It has longer half-life, up to four hours. Uh, Eloprost, uh, we don't use it much, but uh, the problem you have to give uh, so many breaths, uh, up to eight or nine breaths per day, and you have to prepare each uh, uh, of those, so it can be time consuming. Uh, Selexipac, it's oral, it's taken twice uh, daily. Uh, ERA, all of them, uh, Boston 10 uh, need uh, frequent uh, uh, monitoring of the liver function every month. Uh, 
The others, we, we check the liver function occasionally, but it doesn't have to be uh, uh, every month. If you have advanced liver disease, this is contraindicated. Uh, uh, PDA5, the Tadalafil is longer acting than uh, sildenafil. Uh, Rusiguat, which is uh, Adempas, contraindicated with pregnancy as well, contraindicated with a PDA5 inhibitor, because that can precipitate uh, hypotension. Uh, these are the pumps, MS3, the legacy pump, the Tyveso, and uh, Ventavis uh, uh, inhalation machine. Uh, you can use any combination here except these two uh, medicine. And there is a new concept of switching medications around uh, beside adding on therapy. So we usually do add on therapy, but there are some studies trying to see if switching patients from one therapy to another therapy within the same group. So that's, for example, the RESPITE study and REPLACE study trying to replace the PDA5 inhibitor with uh, Riosiquat. Uh, and there was a pilot study that showed an improvement. There is a, a bigger study going on now to see if that can be uh, helpful. We, we follow up the patient in the clinic every three months. We do six-minute walk test every three months, echo about every six months, and you uh, do more frequent testing if you change your medications. We do right heart cath for follow-up if there's worsening of symptoms, if, uh, uh, if you are planning to do changes, big changes in the medication. So we monitor uh, the patients with right heart cath uh, as well. Uh, beside the echo and six minute walk test and getting, getting the basic uh, labs with each uh, clinic uh, visit. Don't only depend, depend on your functional class and six minute walk test. This is a study looked at the functional class and six minute walk test, compared that with a uh, cardiac MRI. You can see the split in the curves here, right ventricular in diastolic volume and right ventricular uh, ejection fraction. There is no split here and there is no separation in the functional class or the six minute walk test at this point, but you can see really the separation of RV function preceding your functional deterioration. So I, I get concerned that if I have a patient who's still within the same functional class, but the echo is getting worse and you have more RV dilation, because you will know the next thing will happen is you will have uh, deterioration of the functional class and six minute walk test. Uh, there is no uh, stable pulmonary hypertension patient. This is a patient we have been following since 2011. You can see the pulmonary artery pressure was elevated, treated, came down. You have to keep a close eye on each patient because it, it doesn't mean the patient is doing fine that the pulmonary hypertension may not progress uh, later. Uh, so you have to keep a close eye, you have to switch your medication, escalate your therapy uh, with each uh, uh, follow-up to get them under control. Finally, prognosis. Uh, Overall, the prognosis has improved. It remains poor outcome, about 67% at three years, better than the predicted NIH uh, uh, outcome, but still it's fatal uh, disease. Uh, we developed multiple scores trying to follow up patients, including the REVEAL registry score and other European uh, score. Uh, in the guidelines, I think they are shifting more to using uh, the European uh, methods more than the reveal score. It had few things for, for example, it's in, in small line here, but PVR more than 32. How many times do you see patients with PVR more than 32? Not, not much, or not at all. Uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure, uh, mean, mean right atrial pressure above 20. So it, you still can use the calculator, but it, it, it had some limitation here. There is an updated version of the calculator which has uh, hospitalization and uh, renal failure as predictors of the outcome uh, as well. Uh, this is the table from the European guidelines. It can predict your outcome in one year, five to uh, five to ten percent, or more than ten percent uh, mortality. Basically, uh, looking at multiple things such as symptoms and functional class, your exercise capacity, and parameters of the RV uh, function, which is uh, listed here in uh, the table. And as you can see, this table, you might have a patient who. Uh, uh, have a good six minute walk test, but high B and B, so it, it, it's difficult to have a patient in the green boxes or in the yellow or red. It's always a mix and similar to Rubik's Cube, actually, you might have good six minute walk distance uh, with uh, advanced functional class, uh, high B and B, uh, elevated pressure by heart cath. So uh, the French, Swedish, and uh, Compare registry, they developed a score using that table and tried to see if that has an impact uh, on your outcome. If you are uh, having more points of low score, intermediate score, high score, and they classify the patient to uh, low, intermediate, and high uh, uh, risk. So this is the same disease, same subgroup, 
and this is a different outcome. Five-year outcome, 35% survival versus 85% survival. So when the patient come and ask about the outcome, it's individualize it and, and shifting you from one uh, risk category to the other can move you in that curve to a better outcome. So it's difficult to, to give prognosis in the first visit. Usually you can tell them, you know, your disease is severe. I think that's what's happening. But to give them a number, it can be difficult without even seeing the response uh, to uh, uh, treatment. And finally, the uh, clinical trials, we are seeing more uh, studies with more uh, uh, numbers targeting more uh, specific endpoints, such as clinical deterioration, uh, need for transplant, need for uh, 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 start of parenteral therapy, rather than just uh, uh, monitoring the six minute walk uh, distance in isolation. So the clinical trials are, are using more combination therapy. They are no, using more uh, uh, endpoints that make sense and uh, can make a difference in the outcome. And uh, it's longer and bigger. So you can see the clinical trials initially used to be 12 to 16 weeks. Now you have clinical trials up to uh, 100 uh, weeks. And finally, these are clinical points. You have to remember that definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, with your main uh, pulmonary artery pressure. You have five types. You have your hemodynamics of uh, your main pulmonary uh, artery, which, and PVR. Uh, always remember to get uh, a VQ scan. Uh, diagnosis is by right heart cath, and uh, vasoactivity test can be done to test for those subgroups. Uh, who can be uh, positive. Actually, it's a good prognostic factor if you are vasoreactive. Uh, it might be a different subgroup in group one. We tend to have better prognosis, so implication of positive vasoreactivity test is possible treatment with calcium channel blocker, uh, possible better outcome, and it's helpful in clinical trial. You don't want to include different patients who are vasoreactive with people who are not uh, vasoreactive. And um, Finally, uh, you don't start calcium channel blocker if you don't have vasoreactivity test, right? Because you can precipitate right-sided heart failure. You will see it, someone see the echo, there is pulmonary hypertension. I will use cardiogen for blood pressure control. That, that's not right. Uh, actually, try to avoid any negative inotropic uh, agent uh, in those uh, patients. And always early referral, early treatment, and you can use combination therapy except these two medications, uh, the Riusic watt and PDE5 inhibitors. Any questions? Um, at what point, like, if my time here, at what point do you start considering transplant? Because I've never heard, have you been further with transplant? No, we, we, have, we have patients referred to transplant, and we have patients who underwent uh, long transplants. Yes, here, yeah. And uh, if, if they are, if, if you are of, if you are on parenteral therapy uh, and you are not responding, you are, you are on a high dose triple therapy, including parenteral, and you are a candidate for transplant, we, we refer. The only problem, most of our patients, they have other so many problems that can uh, exclude them from being referred to transplant, such as BMI, the age, uh, comorbidities. But we have patients before who underwent lung transplant. If you look at our uh, registry here, uh, our uh, transplant percentage is similar to the national uh, average. So usually with pulmonary hypertension, I think the number is about uh, 3 to 2 percent. So if you look at the uh, transplant indications and transplant that happened, it's about 3 percent. And we have a little over more than 100 patients. We have three patients underwent, three to four patients underwent lung transplant, which is reflecting what, what's happening. Yeah. There's one who's getting worked up now, because I was just talking to her about her yesterday. There's one who was on the list, but she was taken off the list. I wish, I wish she was on the list. There's somebody who they, they bounce back and forth. Yeah, there is. The, to you, and now they're back in referral. Yeah, she is, she is a patient who was uh, referred initially for transplant. Her CT scan showed severe emphysema, and pulmonary function test was normal, except decreased DLCO. Um, and she had RVSP of 70 and reduced cardiac index, so we, we give her treatment and basically her pulmonary artery pressure is normal uh, now. Uh, but it, it's a weird case because your PFT doesn't reflect her imaging. Uh, so she is one. And there was another one here, she's very young patient, she's 23, she has partial animals pulmonary has returned, she missed a few appointments and she was taken off the transplant list. So usually, I mean, this data came from the CTIF actually, uh, because initially you, you, they used to do uh, lung, and heart, heart, lung and heart transplant for pH, 
saying that the RV has failed and will not recover, but what they noticed after you do the thrombinder trick to me, you remove the clots and the pressure improve and the RV remodel and comes normal. So they applied the same principle uh, with lung transplant and usually the RV will, uh, will remodel and uh, uh, comes back to normal. With reverse remodeling, you decrease the afterload and should improve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.